So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. I um, hope everyone is safe and well. Um, and yes, and welcome to the UVA Club of Tie Waters evening with Stan Stepanek, um, talking on vampires and disease. Uh, my name is Joshua Stewart. I am the assistant director for UVA Clubs and Global Engagement at UVA, and I get to work with uh, this incredible club um, in South Virginia. Um, I just want to go over a few house rules as far as um, the Zoom goes. If you have any questions, um, be sure to use the chat function. But we also love knowing who's in the room. Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, dropping in a uh, year, uh, what you majored in, um, just to build a sense of community um, during this lecture. Um, and without further ado, uh, I will introduce Malvina Queen, who is one of the co-presidents uh, of the Club of Tidewater. Malvina? Yeah. Uh, wahoo wah. Good evening. I'm Melvina Queen. As Josh just said, I'm one of the co-presidents uh, for the UVA Club of Tidewater. Um, and I just want to welcome everybody for attending one of our um, virtual lecture series. So this is something we're really excited about. Um, and I just want to go ahead and introduce um, Stan. So Stan is the assistant professor, Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures. College of Graduate School of the Arts and Sciences. He has quickly become one of UVA's most beloved professors and his now famous Dracula course constantly tops students generated lists of the best classes on grounds. Um, so tonight we will hear from Stan talking about vampires and disease. Okay, thank you. Oh, I will give you the share screen ability. Okay, share screen ability. All right. I guess I don't. I don't think I need any sound for this one. If so, I will re redo that. Share there. Okay. Let me. Uh, so you, you can still see me. Okay, correct. I see. I see Josh currently. But you can see me on the screen. Okay. Okay, everybody. So um, it's a very fitting time to be giving. Oh, we you know we should probably mute everybody too, just in case we're getting any um feedback yes. from my. I will do that. Mike. Yeah. Just mute all. And they can unmute whenever they want to ask questions later or chat or whatever. Oh, you muted me. Wait, I'll, I'll do mute all and then we'll, okay. That sounds good. Okay, so Josh, I'm still audible, correct? Good? I'm so. <laughs> oh, yes, sir, I muted myself, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everyone, so. Yeah, this is, uh, I always like doing this lecture. Um, last time I did this was a while ago. It was actually for when UVA was doing its, um, those new types of programs they're trying with different types of class structures, stuff like that. Uh, I was part of the epidemics um, forum um, several, years, several years back, and I did a variant of this as part of that. Um, but it's a big thing I like to talk about. It, it's a significant part of my course as well. In fact, I'm currently doing summer session too, and we're getting right into this with students. Um, some of this stuff, but as I have in the main slide here, the vampire, a scapegoat for disease. So today the vampire is associated with lots of stuff. Um, my most popular done for UVA clubs thus far has been the vampire and sexuality one because everyone likes sexy vampires. <laughs> you know, stuff like this with Grim Reapers cutting down human beings is usually not what people um, – <laughs> ask me to talk about but this is a very fitting time for this um you know because of fears of coronavirus epidemics are, are you know are very fresh right now and so you get a sense of what that kind of terror is like now this is why this is so important because today we associate the vampire with lots of stuff you know so i have to sadly mention some more modern things here i know twilight you know it hurts to admit it exists but it does, we have to come to terms at some point. And there's a new book coming out this August, right? Where it's gonna be all told from Edward's perspective. <laughs> I guess you get some backstory in the Edwards, so you know, I, I don't know, I'll probably have to read it or something, you know, it's one of those things, like I gotta teach a class on this, I guess I kinda have to read this garbage. <laughs> but at any rate, so you know, a vampire is a lover, like this is something you readily associate with it today, even though that image really didn't start to develop until 1931 or so. But vampire is a lover today. And we got vampires teaching kids math, you know. This one always makes me laugh because, I mean, I grew up with this. My kid grew up with it. I mean, heck, I, I got this for you today just to goof around a little bit since I have it up here. <laughs> I mean, you got puppets of this, right? And as soon as I taught, you know what the voice is going to be, right? I was going to pull this out. 
Welcome to this event, everybody. Would you like to count with me? I mean, this thing here, which I have on the main slide here with the puppet, and we got the count from Sesame Street introduced in the 70s, a vampire teaching math. Well, you think, well, I mean, yeah, it's called the count, you know, it's kind of a clever wordplay. Originally, the vampire in its connection to counting was that it had a compulsion to count small countable objects. And that's the way you could keep it away. But um, coincidentally, this, this is just coincidence here. The creators of Sesame Street didn't know that folklore. So there was some counting of the vampires in folklore. We got vampires teaching kids math. We got vampire cereals, right? Count Chocula. But originally, that's nothing the vampire was about. This idea of vampire and sexiness really doesn't start until we get this guy, Bela Lugosi, in late 20s on stage and then 1931 on screen. That was really the first time that people associated the vampire with sexuality in a way that it was attractive. It wasn't fearsome because before this, the vampire, in terms of any connection to sexuality, it was a negative thing. It was a sexual violator. That's what it was in old folklore. It could sexually violate you, rape you, things that you don't want to have happen, of course. So Lugosi really is what changed this image. I don't know how many of you have actually read the novel Dracula, but if you do read the novel Dracula, you'll discover pretty quickly that Dracula is discussed in pretty disgusting terms in the book. He has really bad breath. He looks like a corpse. He has these long, sort of disgusting fingernails, barely any hair, so like scraggly hair. His teeth are sticking out. I mean, basically, he's described like a creepy old pedophile. That's, that's the best way to say it in modern parlance. He looks like a creepy old pedophile. <laughs> Nothing attractive about him. Lugosi's what let's really change this. And so people often wonder, you know, what was the original vampire like? Ah, this is what it was like. What you consider a zombie today is essentially what the original Slavic vampire was like. It was a rotting, reanimated corpse. In original belief, only men could become this thing first off. That's just what old folklore believed. That was, that was part of the, the belief system. Um, over time, it changed to women and even babies and stuff. But originally, it was just men, and it was bad men. The guys that came back from the grave that became this thing, they were your robbers and rapists and murderers or suicides and things like that, people that broke rules in some way or who became vampires and today this image of the zombie is essentially an image of the vampire you just didn't know it till i just told you that but this is what it was the slavic people in most cases not all in most cases the vampire was a reanimated filthy disgusting corpse and although of course it could it could kill you and take blood didn't necessarily drink blood by the way one of the primary functions of the vampire that people don't realize unless they really study it is a vampire in reality was really a symbol of disease. Um, this is one of the things we tend to forget these days with all of our medicine. I mean, even right now, right? You know, there are people who are afraid of coronavirus and we're not sure where things are going to go or, you know, I mean, I guess we're a little more calmed down at this point. But when it first started out, especially, I mean, lots of people were really afraid of it, right? Because we didn't know what was going to happen. But we at least have the technology and means of dealing with something like that. Imagine centuries ago where they didn't even know what a virus was. There, there was no conception of that. There was no conception of bacteria. They didn't know what any of that was. It wasn't discovered yet, essentially. Everything was a mystery, and almost any disease could kill you. A sore throat could be your end. You, oh, God. Today, you're like, oh, I got a sore throat. Ricola, right? You pop some <laughs> cough drops or whatever. Back you know, a long time ago, it was like, oh, my God, I got a sore throat. This is it. I know it's coming. Because didn't have venison. Every, almost everything was dangerous. And this is something we tend to forget. So the fear you may have been experiencing with coronavirus prior or maybe even right now, imagine that like times a thousand. And this is like what our ancestors had to deal with. Um, they didn't have the means of dealing with this. They didn't understand quarantine procedures, and none of this stuff was there for them. So when you lack the signs to explain something, well, what do you do? Well, human beings have relied primarily on magic and religion to explain things that we lack explanations for. In anthropology, there's this famous theory called the three spheres of coping. And this is the idea that we have three primary ways of looking at the world, science, magic, and religion. Science is our basic understanding of cause and effect. You know, you test a hypothesis, you see an outcome, and test it again, oh, that's good. And so there are plenty of examples of how folklore and myth actually explain natural phenomena. Here's a really famous one. I mean, well, if you know archaeology, maybe. So don't worry, I'm giving you the vampire. I'm going to get there, don't worry. Um, one of the most um, interesting of these sorts of theories about how things in myth are actually symbols of reality are these giant creature myths you find throughout the world, like dragons in Chinese myth, or the titans as it has Kronos devouring his children there on the right, or the titans, for example, in Greek mythology. So you got a guy on the left there standing next to a fossilized femur of some dinosaur. We'll just assume it's a brontosaurus or something, or it looks like it's actually like a cement mold of one. 
So there's evidence actually that one of the reasons the Greeks came up with the Titans in the mythology is they discovered fossilized remains of dinosaurs in this sort of region in near Greece that I think they call the battleground of giants because there's so many fossilized dinosaur remains there. Now, how do you think the Greeks interpreted that when they came across it? They don't, they don't have the knowledge we have today. They didn't look at that and say, oh, well, <laughs> I know what this is, people. Listen, 50 something million billion years ago, there were these giant lizard beasts that walked upon the earth and they all died and that's what this is here. They don't know that. I mean, the, the, the longest distance of time in their minds is like maybe five, 1,000 years, like 500, 1,000 years, millions of years is like, what? <laughs> they don't know what that is because it doesn't exist in their time, right? It's gone. So they find those fossilized remains, which actually aren't bones, and they think they're bones. And there are some theories in archaeology that that's why they came up with the Titans. They found dinosaur bones, and they were like, holy, what was this? <laughs> Was this thing walking the earth at some point? Must have been condemned by the gods. And this is, you know, their remains here. Wow, there are these giant people walking around. So in that case, assuming that's true, that's an example of where myth is explaining something that's natural, right? It's just the remains of dinosaurs. But our ancestors didn't know that. You can find examples of how um, the natural world has been used to confront problems all over the place. And, and uh, Native American belief and the various implements and things they use, herbs from the forest to deal with problems. So when you lack science, what do you do? Well, in Virginia, we have a number of Native American tribes. Um, six of them were just recognized in federal status back in 2018, including the Monacan Indians who are um, from, well, they were from Natural Bridge, Virginia region. And in that particular part of the world, there was a disease they had to deal with that was really nasty if you didn't know how to deal with it. And all it is is scurvy. Scurvy is a disease anybody can get. All you have to do is don't eat a lot of vitamin C and eventually you'll get scurvy. <laughs> you can, anyone can get it, you know, and just don't eat oranges or don't take any Flintstones gummies for a week or so. And then you'll start doing, you know, start bleeding at the mouth and your joints will start seizing up. So the reason for this and why it was common in Monacan Indian society is they didn't have a lot of vitamin C in their diets. If you're like, okay, well, what'd they do? Get some berries, right? Collect some berries or something like that. There's only so much of that you can do. In their region, somehow somebody discovered that there's a pine tree there that has vitamin C in it. And they, if you eat its bark or if you take its pine needles, you can cure scurvy. Now, they don't know what vitamin C is. If you went back in time and said, hey, I know what your problem is. It's called scurvy. Okay, future man, what else you got for us? Well, all you need to fix this is vitamin C. And they probably ask you, what the hell's that? You'd say, well, it's a vitamin. C. That's all I got. I don't, I don't know what to say. I'm done right there. So they would use things in the natural world, but they don't actually understand the science there. So that's what I'm getting at here. Just like the Slavs centuries ago didn't have the understanding of what actually was causing diseases. Like the Monacans, they don't know what's happening there, but somebody figured out at some point in their culture or another culture that this tree fixes it. We don't know why, but if you eat that tree and it's, some, it's vitamin C is what it's doing. It's curing scurvy. That's what it was. So there's lots of examples of myth and folklore trying to explain the natural world and these problems. One of the most common things you see in mythology throughout the world and folklore is the fear of disease. Human beings have a natural inborn fear of disease. You're experiencing that right now, living history, you are experiencing exactly what it's like to be uncertain about what a disease is going to do, especially at the start of this whole pandemic thing when people were really uncertain and really afraid. And people, again, are depends where you are, you know, how you look at it, but people are calming down somewhat now. We're in phase two in Virginia and so forth. But at the start of it, I remember seeing it. You could see the fear in people's faces just going out and trying to shop or something. I remember there's this one time I went to Wegmans nearby and, um, there was this guy, and no offense to him, there was this guy with a full-on gas mask on. I don't mean like, you know, like a heavy-duty, like, face mask. I mean, it was, a, it was a literal gas mask, and he was walking around like, and all he was buying was toilet paper and bleach. That was all that was in his thing, and the look in his face was just like, like nothing was around him. Like he was just absolutely terrified. That's the kind of thing lots of people were experiencing. And again, imagine if you had no knowledge of viruses whatsoever. We at least know what a virus is. We at least have means of quarantining and figuring out a vaccine or whatever later. They didn't have that stuff. So fear of disease is very common. And one of the most common ways you see this manifest in folklore and myth is a form of demons. Demons are typically a way to explain disease. Lacking the signs, you have something there that causes it. So you have something to look at. When human beings lack an explanation, we like symbols. We like to have something to look at and say, this is what causes that. You know, even though we can't see viruses, we at least know what it is. We can say, oh, a virus caused that. When you don't know that, 
What's causing this stuff? Why are we getting sick? Why are so many of us getting sick? What is it? So you can find this manifesting in lots of cultures. One of my favorite examples of this, and I use this actually in one of my lectures, is what you see in this picture here. Um, in the Maya belief system, so the Kishi Maya, they had this whole creation legend that I won't get into, but part of that legend, um, part of that myth was about the creation of the underworld. And in the underworld were these famous evil gods called the Lords of Sibalba. Sibalba is the Mayan underworld. It means the, the land of fear. You're like, oh my God, I don't want to go there when I die. Like, where's heaven? That's it. Okay, so... You go to you go to Sibalba, and who's there? Well, this is showing a depiction in Mayan art of some of the things that are down there. One of these creatures is evil god. It was called Ahapu, and that means in translation, pus maker. Oh my God! So what is that? It's a god that makes pus. He makes infections, and he's called pus maker. I mean, oh my God! What else they got down there? There's another god that makes scabs and rips them off. His name is Scab Ripper. Oh my God. What other kind of horrible things do they have? There's one called Bile Maker, and he makes you vomit, and it explains jaundice and liver disease. That's how they explained it, right? Why did I puke yesterday? Oh, there's this thing down there in the underworld, and he makes you go, Bleh! that's Bile Maker. And they had another one called Blood Gatherer. That's how they explained anemia. That's who took the blood. If you had a disease that caused anemia, there was a specific god in the underworld that was doing that, and he was called blood gatherer. So the Maya had all these different things to explain all these different ailments. The Slavs had one thing, the vampire. It's the same sort of thought process, fear of disease manifesting in symbols. For the Maya, it was a multiplicity of these evil gods that did a variety of things. This one makes infections. This one here makes you puke and gives you liver disease. This one here takes your blood. The Slavs have one thing that does all of that. It's called the vampire. And that's what its primary function was. The Slavs were also dualists originally. Evidence shows that they had a dualistic belief system. They had two primary gods, one good, one bad. The bad one's on the right there. Chernobyl is what he's called. It means literally the black god, not in the sense of race, the sense of like darkness, destruction, war, and the good one's on the left there. So the vampire was part of the realm of Chernobyl. It was there. It was the thing that created disease and also could kill you. That's what its primary function was. It was the thing that made disease. So the scholars have often wondered, well, considering that, considering the vampire's strong attachment to disease, is there anything, that, what diseases may have been the origin of that? Where could it have come from? Do we know of any diseases that were the origin of the vampire? Parts of it or maybe one disease in particular that was very important in its development as a necessary symbol in Slavic folklore mythology to explain disease. Like, what diseases could there be? So there have been lots of theories of variety of diseases out there. Of course, today people associate the vampire with drinking blood. That's not all it did. In original folklore, it could drink blood, but sometimes it just collected it. You know, so blood drinking and blood contagion is not actually a, a, a factor here they didn't understand that stuff. They didn't really understand how disease could be spread by blood because of bacteria or viruses. They don't know that. So scholars have often wondered, well, you know, what diseases then could be potential origin of the vampire? Where could it have come from? Here you see in this picture a traditional depiction of the original vampire, which the original word for vampire was actually not vampire. It was upir. So here's a traditional upir here. It's just killed a horse. You're like, oh man, I thought they only drank human blood. Oh, they kill anything with blood especially a horse or a cow, because those things are useful to you. So the thing is, is that the vampire was largely unknown. I'll get more into some so the disease thing are getting closer to you, closer and closer. What diseases could there be? But let's first explain what event really led to the vampire becoming the big image that it is today. Because Western Europeans as a whole, before the 18th century, knew almost nothing about the vampire, and the word did not exist yet in Western European languages. There was no word vampire yet. What happened was is this, we call it the great vampire epidemic or just the vampire epidemic from roughly 1725 to about 1755. Although you could say it stretched to about 1775. 1755 is usually the end date for, I'll get to the reason why for that. And disease is one of the reasons this was happening. So what happened? Well, what happened was there were two diseases in particular that were causing people to die. There's epidemics. I'll explain what those diseases are in just a bit. So people were dying, and they don't understand why they're dying. But they've dealt with vampires before. The vampire had been believed in Slavic society, Slavic culture, since at least the 11th century, probably older than that. So it had already been around for like 600 years. 
So they already knew this. They had these old ideas. They knew how to deal with the vampires should they encounter one. And there is a case of this Serbian farmer in 1725 who died suddenly. Even to this day, we're not sure exactly what killed him. It could have been a heart attack or a stroke. And today we understand that. But back then, that's considered what Slavic belief calls an unclean death, meaning he died with no clear indication of sickness. So they were uncertain about that guy. And then sure enough, they thought he came back as a vampire and they thought that he killed nine people. The people were actually dying from diseases. And then about a year later, you get another, another man named Arnold Pavel, which means Paul the Albanian uh, after translating from Serbian. And Paul the Albanian was an Albanian soldier serving for Serbia. And he came home from war and he seemed to be really sort of bizarre and people were asking me what's wrong he told his wife the problem was whenever he was fighting the ottoman turks and he was coming back he encountered an actual vampire and fought it and killed it and he was so afraid of being cursed by the vampire he drank the vampire's blood and ate some of its grave soil you're thinking well, that sounds like a bad idea in traditional folklore it actually makes sense i, mean, I won't explain why but it's, so what he did isn't stupid so at any rate he suddenly dies in a tragic accident falling off of a hay cart or something we're not entirely sure what killed him but Supposedly he was alive for about two to three days. That suggests a spinal injury, maybe neck injury, possibly some sort of aneurysm, severe concussion, whatever it was, lower left image you see here. Vampire attacks start to happen about 40 days later, so-called vampire attacks. People were dying. 13 people died, claiming that Arnold Powell had come to them at night as a shadowy figure with glowing red eyes, like into their bed and strangling them. And those 13 people died. Well, one of them couldn't say what they saw because it was an eight-day-old baby. So there's a baby that died, other people. So the villagers had heard about this Peter Pogodziewicz case in 1725. They were like, hey, I think we got a problem here. People are dying for a reason. There must be vampires everywhere. So they start to put the pieces together. All these people are dying all over the region here. I wonder what it is. They don't know what viruses or bacteria are. That's what's actually happening. They're in the middle of an epidemic. They don't know that. <laughs> they don't know what that is. So they're like, oh, clearly the vampires are making a comeback here. There are vampire attacks increasing. We better do something about this. So as the image is showing you here, they dug up Arnold Powell's corpse, Paul the Albanian's corpse, and they saw these so-called signs of vampirism, which in reality were just misinterpretations of decomposition. So they see he has so-called new skin. His hair and his fingernails had grown, and he was floating in blood. The reason why is because they didn't drain his body, so it was his own blood that came out, and he was floating in it. So as you see in the picture here, they took some sort of pike or a large spear and they rammed it in his body as their forefathers had taught them to do, snapped it off. And according to the sources, when they rammed it in his chest, Paul the Albanian released an audible groan. So it was something like, and they were like, oh my God. And all this blood flew out of his chest. And they were like, damn, <laughs> he's really been drinking. Good thing we got this guy. So they set him on fire, discarded the ashes, and they have all these other vampire victims to deal with here who actually were dying of disease. So they're like, all right, what can we do with these ones? So some of them, they chopped their heads off. Some they covered in garlic and reburied. At least one of them, they covered in poppy seeds. Vampires supposed to have a compulsion that count, counts poppy seeds. Cover it in poppy seeds, reburied it. But the hysteria started to spread. It spread throughout Eastern Europe. It got a little bit into Russia. It was in the Ukraine. It was in Bulgaria. It was in Poland. Image to the upper right there shows you what we call a vampire burial that was discovered during an archaeological dig in Bulgaria. Well, how do we know that's a vampire burial? So a vampire burial is when you take the vampire's corpse and you discover the vampire in the grave and you got your signs of vampirism, which are essentially all misconceptions of decomposition. Then you do something to the body that makes sure it doesn't come back. Maybe, as in the Arnold Powell case, garlic. Maybe you cover it with poppy seeds. Maybe you chop its head off. In this case, in the one right here in Bulgaria, they chopped it into pieces and scattered it around like a puzzle. The idea being that when it wakes up, it won't be able to put itself back together. It obviously worked. Look, never moved. And so it wakes up and it's like, what the hell? Oh my God, my foot's up here. My arm, where's my arm? It's gone. So you chop the vampire up. There are a variety of ways you could deal with it, but setting it on fire, staking it were some of the most common ways they would desecrate the corpse. So this hysteria is spreading and it starts to get into Western Europe and Western Europe is freaking out. So the Arnold Powell case in 1726 is very important because Paul the Albanian in his story gets into Austria and Germany because of soldiers who were serving in Serbia and they were witnessing this stuff. And they were like, what the hell are these people doing? What are you doing? They talked in a little bit and the Serbian you know, farmers would be like, oh, you've never heard of the vampir. They're like, what the hell's a vampir? It's dead body that comes back from the grave and takes your blood and kills you and spreads disease and stuff. Wait, are you serious about this? So, you know, no one knew really, is this, is this legit? 
can this happen? So there were seriously all these academic debates. The vampire goes viral, so to speak, pardon the pun considering the lecture today. And it starts to spread, this idea starts to spread throughout Western Europe. There were people having these big debates in, in universities. Is this real? Is this possible? The church gets involved. They're like, we need someone to figure this out. Eventually, a member of the um, European nobility sends this guy. The founder of the Viennese School of Medicine, Gerard von Sweeten, is sent by Austrian nobility into Serbia and these other countries. They're like, see what's going on here. People are freaking out. We don't want this vampire epidemic and desecration of cor corpses to hit Western Europe. So we need you to can you explain what's actually going on here. So for the science of his time, he was you know ahead of the game. He was a member of the Enlightenment. And in 1755, after seeing all this creepiness, he publishes this very famous work we call The Discourse on the Existence of Ghosts, where he debunks the vampire myth as these sort of old, old barbaric pagan practices of antiquated culture. And using the science available at that time, he's able to debunk it as a, as a real actual thing that can really happen, a dead body coming back from the grave. Because people legitimately thought it was, it was possible when they were hearing these stories. So he debunks the myth that the vampire remained as this cool image. This is why we still have it today. Without the vampire epidemic, it probably wouldn't have come here. But as early as Gerard von Sweeten, people were wondering, there, there's got to be something here that's causing this hysteria. They obviously believe in this. We've got hundreds and thousands of people that believe that this is a real thing, and they're digging up their relatives and their friends and neighbors, and they're chopping their heads off, and they're staking them. I mean, obviously, they're not just joking around. Like, they really think this is legit. There has to be some reason why they're getting to that level of hysteria where they actually think the dead are coming back. Of course, they obviously have an old belief system here, but what is leading them into this? Well, the answer was disease epidemic. That was what it was. So people have often questioned again, well, what diseases may be origin of the vampire? There have been lots of things that have been suggested. Tuberculosis, for example, because it can cause some bleeding from the mouth. Possible. We don't have any direct evidence of that, but it's possible. The vampires, again, the, the vampires, so-called signs of vampirism in the grave are really just misconceptions of decomposition, as you can see in these two gross images here. The way the teeth pull back, they were supposed to have bigger teeth. Vampires were supposed to have a full set of sharp teeth. Not just two, the full mouth of sharp teeth. And the reason why, if you see in the body on the right there, when you begin to decompose, your gums begin to pull, pull back and your skin shrinks. And it makes the teeth appear as though they've grown bigger. It's the same teeth. It's almost like an optical illusion. You're just seeing more of the roots and such. So these signs of amphorism, and of course, they're touching corpses and stuff, that's not good. But let's now consider, what are some major diseases that may be potential origin of the vampire? Well, one big thing that's often discussed, say there's, there's some minor ones like tuberculosis and things I won't get into. I'm talking about the biggest ones. One big thing that's often discussed is mental illness, because you often find in folklore mythology that mental illness is demonized in some way. During the witch craze, for example, in Western Europe, people who were mentally ill were often the ones who were singled out as potential witches, and those are the ones who were tortured and executed. People who, you know, had illnesses or maybe forms of autism, as we call it today, things like that. Not a good time for that. So thus, people have often wondered, well, what, what forms of mental illness may have been potential origins of the vampire? One big suggestion that's often been made is OCD or any, any mental illness that causes a compulsion to count, because not only obsessive compulsive disorder carries that counting um, thing there. So for example, you think like the Count in Sesame Street, some people think that that's maybe where that came from. But in reality, the creators knew nothing about the folklore. But it is in the folklore. In that case of Arnold Powell, that vampire in 1726, one of his so-called victims, another vampire, they covered in poppy seeds because the vampire was supposed to have a compulsion to count small objects. So if you cover it in poppy seeds, that was the most common thing they used. You cover it in poppy seeds when it wakes up in the grave at night, it has to count all those. One, two, three, four, five, six, Jesus, how many are there? Seven, eight. Sun starts to come up, right? It's like 8,535. 8,000, oh, there's the sun. I have to get back to sleep now. <sighs> Wakes up at the next night. Where was I? Damn it. One, two. It has to start all over again. Never finishes. So that one little trait there, some scholars have suggested that probably has a link to mental illnesses and misinterpretations of OCD or other diseases that might cause a compulsion to count. It's very possible. So I can't discuss every single mental illness and its potential connection to the vampire. That would take forever. So the one I like to talk about, and I talk about this in my course as well, is schizophrenia. There's lots of misconceptions about this disease and how it works. 
First thing you should know is that schizophrenia is not split personality disorder or dissociative identity disorder as they tend to call it today. That's an entirely different illness. This is a mistake that the, the average person often makes is they think schizophrenia um, means split personality or multiple personality. Does not. Separate idea. Schizophrenia is technically speaking a disease of the brain. Just like heart disease can be genetically found in the family's lineage, schizophrenia is genetic. Uh, it tends to hit around ages of 18 to 23, and we're still not entirely sure what causes it. Um, there are some environmental triggers that psychologists have noted, um, genetic factors and things like that, but for whatever reason, it just eventually sinks in there, and then the person basically totally changes. I used to work in mental health, and I dealt with lots of schizophrenics, so I, I've seen you know, what it's like face value. It's a very devastating illness. Um, basically what happens is the person becomes consumed by delusions and hallucinations. Their mind starts to take on a new reality. They start to enter what's essentially a permanent state of psychosis where they believe that there's something else going on or they are something else. We had a patient once and he actually believed he was a robot from Venus and he wasn't kidding. Like he, that's actually what he would see in the mirror. That was his reality. And the things he felt were all surrounding that delusion. So they will have false perceptions. That's what hallucinations are. People always think of hearing voices, but it can be anything. You can hear things that aren't there. You could see things that aren't there, of course. Smell things that aren't there. Taste things that aren't there. Feel things that aren't there. All of your senses can be affected by those hallucinations. And they usually will revolve around that delusion and that you know bizarre other reality idea that the schizophrenic develops. So schizophrenia really serves as a good catch-all for how mental illness can be misinterpreted because it shares lots of features with lots of mental illnesses. So people who have schizophrenia will experience mania, extreme depression, their sleep cycles will change and things like that. So this one I just use as a general catch-all for the understanding of how mental illness works because we can find mental il illness demonized in lots of cultures because of the lack of understanding of it many centuries ago. Witchcraft is one of the best examples of that. Those are the witches were often be people who were actually mentally ill. So for the vampire, well, how would that be a factor? One of the critical details here that you should note is that the vampire, by definition, cannot exist until somebody has died. So if somebody is alive and mentally ill, they wouldn't be like, oh, there's a vampire right there. We should kill him, right? And start staking someone who's alive. Get him! Ah! You wouldn't do that. Because by definition, they have to be dead first. So you would just note, hey, that guy down the street there, a little unusual, probably going to be a vampire after he dies <laughs> you know we'll just have to do something there so it would be more of a marker during life a potential vampirism after death not necessarily a misinterpretation some people have suggested the extreme strength a vampire has may be a misinterpretation of disease like this states of mania or this sort of heightened states of adrenaline where people can sometimes get really strong which i've seen working in mental health people that enter these mental states and are very difficult to control um, possibly, but difficult to actually find evidence of that. But there is definitely a suggestion there that mental illness has been somehow misinterpreted as part of the vampire myth. The counting compulsion being one of the most clear examples of that. But let's get into the actual ones here that are really important. There's one disease that's been suggested sometimes, and it's porphyria. I wouldn't doubt if some of you haven't heard of that. Um, it's known for causing hypersensitivity to sunlight. Um, I'm actually not going to discuss that one because porphyria, in my opinion, is actually not an origin of the vampire. It's a misinterpretation of a disease by modern medicine, looking at media vampires and thinking that's what the folklore is and not actually knowing where it came from. So I'm not going to get into it, but porphyria you may have heard of. In fact, there's at least two articles I found in medical journals about its so-called connection to the vampire, but it's not, there's no evidence that can prove it. Um, and I, I disagree with it entirely. So what were some diseases then we can definitely say this is an origin for part of the vampire at least? Well, one of the easiest ways to do that is to look at the vampire epidemic that I just talked about not too long ago with Arnold Powell and the stakings and all this bodies and stuff and the idea spreading to Western Europe. During the vampire epidemic, we know disease was one of the central problems. When disease goes haywire, when we enter a pandemic, when people don't know what to do, people get very easily frustrated and upset and very fearful, right? So when you enter that kind of mental state, and these ideas are already there about vampires, they can spread rapidly, especially in an era when you have no way of dealing with it, when you don't even know what a virus is. So thus, if you look at the vampire epidemic, because we have the clearest data at that period, what diseases may have been prevalent that were probably causing the actual deaths? Well, thankfully, we have data on the two big ones that we know for sure were an origin of the vampire. The first one, which would have existed before that time, but was um, a big problem during the 18th century in Eastern Europe, rabies, 
okay, rabies. So we know lots of the actual deaths that were being caused during the vampire epidemic were being caused by rabies epidemics. Rabies epidemics were sweeping Eastern Europe. And we know in a number of cases, the way that rabies was being spread, if it can't get any creepier than rabies, is rabies being spread by rabid wolves. And in Slavic belief, the wolf already has a connection to vampires and this is sort of, you know, symbol of the power of nature. So in Eastern Europe, rabies epidemics were occurring because rabid wolves were spreading them in villages. Ima imagine that beast coming into your village, right? I mean, they're big. <laughs> they're big, they're, they're fierce. As you can see in this, this woodcut here, although that's not a wolf, it's a dog, you know, you get something that's rabid, it enters the so-called furious state of rabies, which is roughly 80% of rabies cases, we'll get to that. I mean, it's basically an unstoppable killing machine. I used to, I grew up on a small farm when I was um, younger and, you know, sometimes you have rabid raccoon come out of the, come out of the woods there and you got sheep and you got pigs, you're like, oh damn, we got, we don't have time for animal control, it comes out. <sighs> They're like, oh, here it's going. Here we go. You know, get the gun. So it's like old yeller, right? All right, son, get the gun. You're like, okay. And this one time we had this rabbit raccoon coming. Pulled out the rifle. You know, it's not, not time for this because it's going to go into the pen, right? So pow, shot the raccoon. It's like, boom, boom, boom. no joke. It's like, <sighs> starts like pulling itself in the ground. I'm like, oh my God, how did it take a bullet? And it took another one too. So shoot it again. Pow. Flies over, and then it's just like, ah. we're like, oh my God. There's a reason rabies is derived from a Latin word meaning madness or fury, because most cases of rabies enter what's called the furious state, where the individual or animal becomes an unstoppable killing machine, basically. Like they just won't stop. So, rabies, very nasty disease. It's a viral infection. The way this disease works is it's spread primarily via biting. And you probably know that. In fact, probably everybody listening to this lecture right now has probably at some point seen or maybe even been bitten by a rabbit or potentially rabid animal. You probably have at least seen it somewhere. Usually it's a raccoon. I had a student one year that said she was run down by a rabid fox, a little more scary. Um, and that one too, she was like on her bike with her brother and she said he was ch being chased by this thing. And she said, I feel so bad today, but I just left him behind. I just kept going. I was in survival mode. He's like, help me, sis. And I'm like, no, I just kept going. And thankfully a dog diverted it and he didn't attack him anymore. So you probably have seen something rabid, but we know today what it is. And there's a vaccine for it. They didn't have a vaccine back then. Okay. So when this is spread by biting, right? A rabid wolf comes running through the village there. It's probably going to infect 10, 20 people, maybe. They're like, oh, God, that wolf was crazy. That wasn't a normal wolf. I hope everyone's all right. You okay? Yeah. Oh, man. You okay there, Uncle Yvonne? You got a pretty nasty bite. Yeah, I'm all right. I'm good. You sure? Yeah, I'll be fine. <laughs> Two weeks later, or I mean, probably actually more like a week later, it incubates pretty quickly in most cases, like five or seven days tops. Uncle Yvonne hasn't been out of his house in like a three or so days. Yeah, go check and see how he's doing. All right, go up to the door there. <laughs> Uncle Yvonne, you all right in there? Open the door, his wife's body is over there mutilated. You're like, uh, hey, Uncle Yvonne, there's something hiding in the corner there. You're like, hey, Yvonne, are you okay? <laughs> They'll all come at you, like they will attack. So when something gets rabies, it can enter one of two primary states. There's the paralytic type, the catatonic type of rabies, where you just basically fall inactive. And that has connections to vampire folklore and stuff. But the furious version is roughly 80% of cases, where eventually the individual becomes like this sort of unstoppable attack machine. Just enters like attack mode. They'll attack almost anything. They'll attack their own reflection. They become adverse to certain smells like garlic they might avoid. They'll avoid water. One of the primary things you find in vampire folklore about vampire and water is a vampire cannot cross running water unless being carried in some way. That happens in the novel Dracula, for example. It's a very common and pretty well-known example of vampire weakness in folklore. That comes from rabies because a rabid animal or person will avoid water or they won't cross a stream, especially if it's running. So we know for sure that's where that one came from. And it would have been there before because rabies is an ancient disease. It's been around for a long time. So you've got spreading by biting. You've got a version of sunlight sometimes as well. Lots of things come together here for this one disease. And it's fierce when like a human being gets it. Today we have a vaccine, of course. We have a vaccine for a long time. But if someone actually reaches that eventual state, it's like a 99.9% .9 mortality rate. Um, in recorded history, there is only one person in recorded history who has ever survived full-blown rabies. She has her own website about it even. They had to do a special, like they put her in a coma and stuff. It was this very special procedure where basically they said to their parents, they were like, listen, your daughter's going to die 
or we can try this special method here. And she might die with that too, but at least she'll have a chance that way. If you just let her sit around, she will die. Rabies will kill her. So they're like, all right, let's try. And she, she came back from it. Only one person in history has survived this disease. During the vampire epidemic in Eastern Europe, there's evidence that this disease wiped out whole villages where people would just abandon the village or everyone would eventually get it and they're attacking each other and screaming. And how do you think they interpreted that? I mean, if you're afraid of coronavirus, right? Like that, that's, that's fearsome in itself. Imagine the disease that makes you attack your own wife or your children or your neighbors. How do you think they interpreted that kind of thing back then? These people aren't human anymore. Or what, what, what's, what's infected them is some, some magical force. The vampire is what caused that. So the vampire's connection to rabies is very clear in a number of ways. And this disease was not coincidentally epidemic during the vampire epidemic and was causing the actual deaths. So we have data from that period prior to that, like 1349 when there was another vampire epidemic. We don't actually have data on what may have been causing the deaths. Black death is probably part of it, but probably more rabies epidemics because without the vaccine, it can spread fast. There is another big one though, very little known disease. So you've heard of rabies, I'm sure. Maybe you had the vaccine at some point. This one you probably haven't heard of. The other big disease that was causing the actual deaths in Eastern Europe is a disease that's called pellagra. Pellagra, very little, if you're in medicine, you probably have heard of it. So students that have in nursing and stuff, they'd be like, oh yeah, I heard of that one. I didn't know it was connected to vampires though. So what is pellagra? Very easy to explain. Pellagra is an ancient disease. It was recognized by the Aztecs even. The Aztecs had this goddess slash god of corn called Sentiatl. Because corn was central to Aztec way of life. And lots of those pre-Columbian cultures, corn was like really like their central food. And they would have knew what this disease was. Because what causes pellagra essentially is a diet that's too high in corn and low in other things. So the Aztecs had a way to deal with this. They figured out that if they wash corn in a special lime-based solution, it somehow makes the disease go away. Now, they don't know the science there. They don't know the actual science back then. All they know is this somehow makes the corn better and they have a God that surrounds that and rituals with that God that makes sense out of all that stuff going on there. Today, we know what it actually is. Pellagra is simply a deficiency of niacin, B3, vitamin B3, and tryptophan. That's all it is. Deficiency of B3 and tryptophan. Similar to how scurvy, as I mentioned earlier, is a deficiency of vitamin C. This is just a deficiency of B3 and tryptophan. So what happens? Well, what happens is quite simple. So the way that it happens dietarily is if, you, if corn is like a big part of your diet, and you're not really getting enough fats and meats or diverse vegetables and fruits, you'll eventually get pellagra in about one to two weeks. Turn yourself into a vampire. Have some fun. Get a bunch of corn. Just get a bunch of corn on the cob and just eat that for like two weeks straight. Nothing else. You'll turn into a real life vampire. You'll start to get averse to the sunlight and get, ah, you'll start to bleed from the mouth. So the deficiency is very easy to fix, but they didn't know any of this stuff. And what happened was corn had been introduced as a new food source into Eastern Europe. It doesn't really hit Serbia, though, and those other parts of Eastern Europe until the 18th century, meaning this disease, unlike rabies, didn't exist in Eastern Europe prior to that vampire epidemic era. Coincidentally, it hits around that same time. In Serbia, for example, Serbia was war-torn because of warfare between uh, Catholic Europe and the Ottoman Empire to the south, right? They were constantly fighting over that region for a long time. So you had these people that were peasants living out in the middle of nowhere. They were poorly educated, illiterate, relying on old folklore to survive and using primitive farming tactics they had used for 500 or more years. So they were stuck in like an antiquated, almost medieval lifestyle. And then corn is introduced, cornmeal specifically, and they're like, oh, this is great. Once I run out of my food stores for the year and my animal meats and stuff like that, I can just eat this corn. And they would tend to eat a lot of that cornmeal and stuff right around when springtime hits, which by coincidence happens to be a time of year in Slavic belief when the vampire and other evil creatures are at their height of power. When the ice begins to thaw and spring's hitting, is right when they're supposed to be one of, the, one of the periods during the year when they're supposed to be at their strongest. And that's when this disease was starting to hit because they were starting to eat a lot of corn right before that, since by chance their food stores had dwindled. So they started to eat lots of cornmeal and then they started to get pellagra. 
So pellagra will cause a lot of symptoms. One of the things it's known for is giving you the sort of corpse-like skin as you're seeing in this main image here. So the person becomes sensitive to the sunlight. And like, ah. So, but unlike another disease, porphyria, it doesn't become reactive in the same way where it actually will damage your skin. It makes your skin more, more sort of like corpse-like in appearance. It's sort of like almost parchment-like skin. This, this characteristic butterfly type rash that you see in this young woman here is one of the things it's known for. But it causes other stuff too, horrible breath. We think that's where the vampire got that one. That was probably not an original trait from folklore. So Dracula, the novel Dracula, has rank breath, it says. His breath is horrible. We think pellagra is the origin of that one particular one. So you've got some sensitivity, aversion to sunlight. You've got horrible breath. What else has it got? It features something called pica, where the individuals start to eat odd things, stories of people eating dirt. Like in the Arnold Powell case, for example, this famous vampire from 1726, he claimed he encountered a vampire, and after he killed it, he ate some of the vampire's grave soil. People today think he probably was actually suffering from pellagra, and so he probably actually did eat dirt, because it causes pica, and you'll eat odd things. So pica will happen. The person also experiences anemia. Now, I have Crohn's disease, and I'm not talking about it, because it actually relates to the vampire, through pellagra. So in Crohn's, one of the things that happens because your immune system attacks your intestines is you develop these lesions in the, the middle region there. And they start to bleed and they're very sensitive. So even today, if I have too much garlic, I'll get like, I'll get lot, like really painful, like really painful stomach. It's just the cramping is incredible. So I just, I don't really eat garlic, you know. Pellagra, it's the same thing. They have to avoid garlic because it causes pain. And the reason why is that the garlic oil is very strong, right? And um, if it touches that, those lesions in there. It's like having a sore in your hand. It's, it's burns. It's painful. So pellagra causes the same kind of lesions you get with Crohn's and it starts to bleed internally. You start to bleed internally. And what happens is as you begin to bleed more and more, your iron stores go down and your iron stores and your bone marrow begin to dwindle and you start to get really pale skin and your skin turns like this translucent, almost gray like color. I had that happen to me when I had Crohn's. I weighed, so right now I'm like 185 pounds. Back then I was 124, 60 pounds less. My hair is falling out in chunks. You start to look like a corpse. And they would have understood that when someone is getting like this, this paleness, just like the Maya understood it, and they had this thing called blood gather that took your blood and explained paleness and loss of blood. The Slavs knew this too. If someone gets like that, they're losing blood. But there's no clear injuries. Where is it going? Well, the vampire takes that. The vampire already did that. So this simply verifies that idea that was already there, right? Oh, we know it does this. We know why that person is getting pale. In actuality, it's because they have a disease that's causing them to bleed internally. But they think the vampire is coming at night and taking it from them. That's what it's doing. So blood loss. And you might think, well, wait, wait. I mean, it's kind of gross. But wait, when you go to the bathroom, like, wouldn't you see blood then? Mm-mm. Because it's happening in the middle region and it goes through digestion, see? So you don't see it. So it'd be a big mystery to them, right? We're, we're, we know this person's losing blood, but how are they losing it? Oh, that's right. We got this thing, right? And there must be a lot of them around right now. In actuality, it's virus, and it's a dietary deficiency that's spreading throughout Eastern Europe that's causing the actual deaths. So pellagra has a lot of interesting connections with the vampire, but the important detail here about pellagra, although it's connected to it, is that this did not exist before the 18th century, which means it would have verified some things that were already there and potentially added some more, the, the rank and nasty breath being the clearest example of that. So pellagra, rabies are the two big diseases that we can definitively connect to the vampire. There have been suggestions of lots of other ones, but the primary thing to remember here, I'll just, I'll stay right here in Santiago, I guess. We'll go back to like the main slide. The primary thing to remember here is that the vampire was a symbol of any disease, right? So there's not just one disease that caused this thing to come about. It was the necessity in having something to explain anything like that that happened. That's why the Slavic people came up with this idea. It served that purpose. And you find demons in folklore and myth throughout the world, as I said earlier, that's the kind of function they tend to have. They tend to be there to explain diseases and ailments and things. As, that's why I mentioned the Maya. I may have said, why is he talking about this? Because for the Maya, they had a variety of things to explain infections, to explain vomiting, to explain anemia. For the Slavs, it was just one thing, a little more convenient, right? We got one thing that does all that stuff. So if you get a sore throat or you're somehow getting anemic or, you know, you suddenly fall over and die, that's probably what did it. It gives a face to something they couldn't understand. And that's 
primarily where it came from and what it was used for. Today, it's a symbol of sexuality and it's in video games and it teaches kids math and it's chocolatey, delicious cereal at Halloween time. But originally, what it was for was to explain disease because they didn't understand what it was. Okay, so how much time I was at there? I hope that was... Okay, oh boy, I'm longer than I expected, I'm sorry. I was like, that feels about 30 minutes. <laughs> No, thank you. I mean, yeah. that was pretty riveting. Um, yeah, and there's more things I can talk about, of course, but I try to, you know, center on yeah. some important details. All right. Now will be the time uh, to ask questions. If you have any, we're going to move into the Q&A section. I guess we can um, stop this, we'll still, like, stop share in case anyone wants to have their face visible or something. I'll just do right, it like that. Absolutely. So thanks, everybody. Oh, I see Althea. Hi, Althea. Good to see everybody again here. Who I've seen before. Yeah, so it's, a, it's always an interesting topic, and there's way more I could talk about. Again, I was trying to focus on the sort of biggest ideas. Porphyria, for example, I didn't have time to talk about, was a disease that doctors have often suggested, oh, this is clearly connected to the vampire. I would say no for reasons I won't get into, but there are lots of other diseases that have been connected to it. All right, questions. All right. So we have the, the first question. Oh, in chat. Did you? <laughs> so we have. Oh, yeah, someone sent you one. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how did you get interested in vampires is the first one that I see. Yeah, this is, this is always a question I get, you know, I always talk about this. Students will talk to me or people, you know, outside UVA be like, so what do you do? And I'll be like, oh, I, I, I teach at UVA. Like, oh, wow, that's a great school. Well, what kind of things do you teach there? And I usually try to always start by saying the important stuff. I'll be like, oh, first year Russian, second year Russian, first and second year Polish, you know, oh, oh. Okay, I, that sounds like it's probably important to somebody. Okay, what else? Hey, a Russian East European film, you know, I taught that. Uh, oh, okay, so some weird like film nerd stuff. All right, what else you got? And then eventually I'll be like, yeah, I teach this class on vampires called Dracula. And they usually are like, <laughs> they'll like, they'll laugh and they'll be like, what the hell is that about? What can you even talk about with that? Then I'll start talking about it and they're like, oh, wow. That's, actually, I didn't realize there was that much stuff in there. So I always get the question inevitably. What got you so into this vampire stuff? Are you some like big vampire freak? Like, you must be like totally obsessed with vampires. No, I mean, I mean, I do play a, a live action vampire role playing game. I'll admit that. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I've watched some. <laughs> well, I've got the book right here. I've I um I've watched some vampire films. I play vampire video games, but it's not really any different than anyone else. I, I just happen to know a lot about them and teach a course on it at this point. Um, but as a kid, I was always really interested in the occult and ghosts and things like that. I grew up in a house that was built in 1823. It was supposed to be haunted, and even though I don't actually believe that, it was always fun to just think that, right? Because people just people like that kind of thing, right? We we like ghosts. We like thinking there's life after death, and it's part of what the vampire's about, right? We like that that stuff we're drawn to this kind of thing so it was always fun you know like thinking you were in a haunted house even though i didn't really believe it you know, but as a kid i was also kind of bullied and ostracized so i started getting you know interested in the weird stuff and comic books and things and eventually you know given a chance to teach a class and i was like can i make it my own class or like sure do whatever you want and then you know here we are so <laughs> it was basically an accident in fact originally this is a little i won't go too much detail here originally i was going to be a federal agent for the fbi actually and i was two months away from quantico but i got diagnosed with crohn's disease so seven years of hard work and almost getting in the fbi went bye bye and i was like uh oh well i got this vampire class i guess i'll keep riding that one out and see where it goes and well thankfully here i am yeah so just kind of almost accidental you know yeah. Hey, we have a question from John, uh, John Dahl. Okay. Oh, there he is right there. I guess. says, yeah. have you read Michael Bell's book, Food for the Dead, which is about the Mercy Brown vampire case in New England, linked yes. to TB? Is there any link between Slavic vampires and cats? And cats? Did you say cats? Cats, yep. Oh, okay, interesting. Okay, yeah, there is a little bit there. Um, so first off, the tuberculosis thing. So that's another good example of the vampire and its relationship to disease. And that is one of the, so this uh, vamp, this like sort of mini vampire epidemic that happens in New England is one of the reasons that people have connected tuberculosis to the vampire. Um, one of the primary reasons that happened though that should be stated, uh, tuberculosis is a pretty widespread disease and would have definitely existed a long time ago. But considering this new, this new England vampire panic, and um, by the way, Bram Stoker who wrote Dracula, he actually researched that event as part of writing the novel Dracula. So he knew about it. Um, he knew about the staking. I actually had a student one year and she was descended from one of the people that was actually staked in the grave. She was like, that was like my great, great, great grandmother. I was like, cool. Yeah, so basically you're a vampire, essentially. You know, genetically speaking, you're, you're the undead. She's like, yeah, I guess so. So she asked me about it and I said, um, 
what actually happened there was in that part of New England, there was a significant Slavic population that were miners and they had come from the old world and they brought those beliefs with them. So when tuberculosis started to spread in New England, right, at that time, people didn't, know, you know, didn't really have knowledge of what it was and germ theory was just really starting to develop. So a lot of people that were there, they were like, oh, hey, everybody, <laughs> I know what this is. They're like, yeah, what's that? They're like, well, hey, listen, okay, there's this thing that you don't know about, but I'm gonna tell you right now, the dead come back and it's called the vampire, all right? So you got vampires here and you gotta do something. What do you have to do? You gotta dig them up. And I'll tell you how to look for the signs too. And whenever you find those, they're just teaching them their folklore, right? They're teaching them their culture, basically. When we find this and this and this, that's how we're gonna know it's a vampire. And then you gotta whoosh, chop off its head, all right, you sure? What if we don't? Well, they're gonna keep coming you're going to keep dying. So they're like, oh, right, all right, we better do that then. So then they start to actually <laughs> desecrate some corpses and stuff. I mean, I shouldn't laugh, you know, but that's what happened there. Because um, when I first heard about it, I was like, that's interesting that they would actually, like, it, I thought originally before I really knew about it that maybe they heard about the vampire and then they just became consumed by it. But I was like, mm, that's, that's unlikely. There had to be some Slavic connection there. And eventually I found that there was a Slavic population that worked in mines there. And they told them, they're like, oh, no, we know what's going on here. Everybody, listen up. I came from the old world. I know what this is. And everyone's like, okay. And yeah, they believed it. So that cats. Now, vampire and shape-shifting is something I get asked about sometimes. What kind of things can the vampire turn into? Well, if you read the novel Dracula, which some of you maybe have. It's not that good of a book, by the way. <laughs> some of you probably have read the novel Dracula. He changes into a bat in there, right? So people usually think, like the Count in Sesame Street. Oh, well, folklore of the vampire must have turned into a bat. Nope, there's no connection with the vampire and the bat, actually. Wolves, they could change into that. But they primarily turned into symbols of death, see, death and disease, because that's what they were. They were symbols of death and disease. So the vampire could turn into a raven. You often find depictions of them in folklore, like the vampires wandering down the road, and there's all these ravens swooping around, and it's like, ah, get off of me. Because, you know, it's a corpse, and ravens like to eat roadkill and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, so they're like, oh, wow, it's a walking corpse. This is great. It's a walking buffet here. So they turn into ravens. They could turn into snakes, maggots, vermin, that kind of stuff. But there are some instances where they could turn into cats. Or if you burn their corpse, a black cat might jump out of it. And you'd have to go kill the cat because that's essentially a vampire there that's shapeshifted. So it's not as common. You tend to see wolf being the more common, you know, animal that's not like vermin. Um, but there is a little association with cats. I've seen it a few times. Answer the question. Like, <laughs> John, does that sound good? Okay. Yeah, I got a head nod. Okay, I got, I got a thumbs up <laughs> and a nod. Okay, I'll go with that. <laughs> Perfect. Next question is from Joseph Frederame. Oh, that's all right. What Slavic country is most associated with vampires? Romania has capitalized on it more for tourism. Oh, okay, sure. So Romania, you probably know about Vlad the Third Tepish, Vlad Dracula, the Impaler, you know, the, the real Dracula, who actually did drink blood um, a little bit. But so that Romanian ruler, you know, and everything, of course, Dracula being connected with that region and Transylvania being part of Romania, they, they've, they've really capitalized that, of course. But first important detail is Romania is not a Slavic country. It's in that region. And they share lots of the beliefs that the Slavs had. They probably got it from them. Um, but it's actually not, it's a, it's not a Slavic language. Same thing of Hungary, by the way. Hungary is right next to it. Hungary is also not a Slavic country, but they share lots of similarities because of their connection to the Carpathian Mountains and vampires and stuff. So Romanian vampire belief is derived um, largely from Slavic belief, but they have lots of similarities. And they have some of their own little things too. Um, but so Romania is not Slavic, but they definitely capitalized on it primarily because of the whole Vlad the Impaler, Vlad Dracula thing. It's how they do it, um, you know, because of the novel Dracula. And they know that he was a partial inspiration for the character. Okay. Oh, let's see. We got this. Uh... Oh, okay. So John is saying here, there's a link between schizophrenia and Toxoplasmus gondii, which is a cat parasite. Okay. I heard about this. Some thought that people around cats are more likely to get this parasite. Okay, so that, that could be another connection there. Now, again, this is one thing about schizophrenia and, and, um, that I mentioned is the connection of mental illness and vampires. We can't like as clearly definitively say, here's our evidence for that, like rabies and pelagra. Like rabies, we're like, here's, this, here's the day that people that actually died and the areas we have the vampire epidemic freaking out at, right? And we can connect those things. So yeah, possibly, possibly for sure. And a lot of people did keep cats in the house to kill roaches and stuff. So it's definitely possible. Um, that there could be some link with that, for sure. I have heard, of, uh, I've heard about that. Okay. 
but, but keep in mind, they wouldn't understand that the cat was causing it, right? That's, that's one of the problems. They wouldn't be like, wait a minute. I think there's this thing called Toxoplasma gondii in the cat poop. That must be it. And they wouldn't know that. So cat being largely considered a good positive thing in Slavic belief, they probably would have made that association. But a black cat is a sort of universal image of negativity and bad luck. So sometimes a vampire would do that. But so yeah, possibly there might be some link there. Possibly. Okay. What else you got? Oh, wait. Yeah, oh, so wait. Did I answer the other question from Joseph? Yes. Okay. Sorry. I was like, I got. It. No, 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 no. You did. Well, I think so. He said, "What Slavic country is most associated?" Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So since Romania is not Slavic, let's now consider what Slavic country is most associated with it. So that's really a tough one. Um, Russia, for example, the vampire had less of an impact there because they were a little more farther removed from the, the epidemic that was happening. Um, you know, under Catherine the Second and stuff like that, Peter the Great, um, you know, potatoes were becoming the big thing over there because it wasn't originally a a crop that was indigenous to Russia. Um, so that didn't really hit there. So I would have to say probably either Poland or Serbia. There were a number of vampire burrows in Poland, but Serbia I probably would have to go with because Serbia is really where the vampire epidemic starts and where we get most of our data from concerning it and how, it's, how the, this epidemic of vampire belief began to spread. And it's out of Serbia that the Arnold Powell case became famous in Western Europe through German and Austrian newspapers at first. And that's actually, I forgot to mention this, that's actually how the word vampires first introduced in the Western European languages was from that case. Um, in, in German, the vampire, right? The vampire is how it first came into the language. And then English for the first time around 1734 as vampire. So, you know, it went viral for about eight years there. Um, but I'd have to say Serbia because that's kind of like the big center okay let's see wait john's saying here the film nosferatu oh yeah good good example here the film nosferatu it's a 1922 german film which is going to have its 100 year anniversary soon here so we're planning to do a big thing at the virginia film festival by the way for that that i'll be a part of but at any rate the film nosferatu seems to have a couple of references to rats and of course that's taken from the novel dracula because dracula can control rats you mentioned that vampires can become rats but i thought maybe the filmmakers are making a connection to disease any link between vampires and plague outbreaks okay so first thing here about nosferatu and the whole rats is that fw Murnau, the director of that film and the producer and writer and stuff they were getting that idea of vampire and rats from the novel dracula because it happens in dracula he makes a sort of swarm of rats in the one scene especially so they were taking that but it also served their symbolic purposes at that time very well so some people have often looked at nosferatu and debated whether or not it was a symbol of anti-semitism there's been some good arguments about that but one of the big symbols about what the vampire and nosferatu they call him count orlock in the original version what he symbolizes is the impact of disease because don't forget that's 1922 that's four years after the flu pandemic right and had a big impact in germany as did world war one so the impact of war and its spread of disease which is part of why the pandemic happened at that time it's very relevant because people have often been discussing and debating you know the coronavirus versus flu pandemic 1918 so that's part of where nosferatu is a symbol that vampire and that and that's how it worked because people still had that fear they're like oh man remember that like 10 million people died you know back then woof and the rats spreading it and stuff, because that's what happened during the war, right? Rats would spread disease in the trenches and could give people trench fever and stuff like that. So there's definitely a connection with rats and vampires, because you'll see that's in, in folklore for sure. So plague outbreaks. So we know, um, I mentioned earlier that one of the earliest references we have to a vampire epidemic is actually 1349, right? This is during the time of um, Black Death and stuff like that. So the Black Death didn't hit Eastern Europe as heavily as it did Western Europe. It did, but it wasn't as big. Um, but in Serbia, we know in 1349, we have evidence of legal codes written forbidding vampire burials, you know, forbidding anybody digging up a body and chopping its head off or staking it or setting it on fire or whatever, just, you know, stop the vampire. So why is that important? Because it means it was a big enough of a problem that they had to make a law, you see. It doesn't mean it wasn't just one case. It means it was probably a lot of cases. And the Black Death may have had something to do with that because the vampire would have explained what was happening there. They'd be like, oh, wait, we know what's causing this. <laughs> Those people in Europe don't get it. All they got to do is chop off some heads and steaks and fire, and it's good. So there is a connection there to plague for sure because, again, it can explain any disease. Um, we have some connection to that. Um, but, again, it didn't hit Eastern Europe as heavily as it did Western Europe, but it definitely was there. Um, yeah, so we got that. I'm trying to think of any other instances of the plague and vampire. There have been some recent cases of, you know, I know in, I think Romania, this is actually, so by the way, there are still people who legitimately believe in the vampire as a real thing, like as this real entity. Um, in Romania, this may have been in 2010 or so, it may have been a little, um, 
be even older than that, 2008, 2010, there was a case of a vampire burial they did um, because a young girl was getting, she was having this, essentially you could tell if you actually, you know, study mental illness or work in that field at all, you'd read the story and be like, oh, well, she's clearly probably mentally ill in some way. But, you know, in this village out in the middle of nowhere, they're like, okay. And she's saying like, I forget, she was saying like her brother was coming back from the dead and attacking her. They're like, oh, we know what this is. Right? And so they had to go deal with the body then, you know. So um, there are still cases of where you see the vampire having that exact function, especially in lack of knowledge about mental illness, which is, you know, sadly even common in developed society like America because people don't like to talk about it. Um, in a village like that, you know, oh, we know what this is. So plague for sure, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Ask me anything. You know, I don't care. I'll talk all night. Vampires all the time. <laughs> I think we're going to cut it there. Oh, um, but thank you all, John, and thank you for. Uh, yeah, thank you, John. Thank you for going for that uh, conversation. That was awesome. Um, and thank you, Stan, for that talk. I thought it was fantastic. Um, yeah. Everybody here really loved. Oh, um, I got a clap. Oh, yeah, you got a clap emoji. Clap, clap emoji. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, thank you for taking the time to share yeah. um, your passion and a yeah. vast knowledge of. Yeah. Um, about vampires. vampires as well as uh epidemia so that's <laughs> that was, um, very yeah. very um, impressive and I think yeah thanks a lot everybody really appreciate it yeah sorry i was a little late starting there but i'd make sure i had some stuff ready and everything melvina do you have any final words about upcoming things or things to look out for um yeah so we will have um city link coming up so our, all of our prospective students that will be coming in um, that have graduated actually, all of the uh, students that will be coming towards the Tidewater area. We will have a CityLink discussion next week um, on the 25th so they can kind of scope out uh, the Tidewater area as a possible place to relocate um, for their first jobs. And we will be doing who's in the know. So we'll have um, other opportunities and activities for you guys to kind of stay linked and to the university. So just be on the lookout for some of our emails. But again, thank you, Stan. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, so you much, Malvina. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, have a great night, everyone. Uh -huh. See you.